Hey everybody, Keith Billick here with another episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Want to take a quick minute to thank all of you who have been regular listeners to the podcast and also welcome anybody who's just checking it out for the first time. I really hope you like it. Of particular thanks, I'd like to point out that I have been getting everybody's social media comments and emails. Hopefully you've been getting my responses. I try to reply to all of them, and I think I've been able to do that so far. Really love hearing from you and hearing about your suggestions and comments that way. A common theme of recent comments has been, hey man, it's been like a month since the last episode. What uh, What's going on here? So to those of you who had those thoughts, first of all, thank you for being so anxious for the content. I definitely wanted to be a little quicker getting this one out. But if any of you are parents of school-aged children, such as myself, you know that the springtime is when you begin going to lots of track meets and orchestra concerts and soccer games and things like that. So my free time has been a little short lately, but also I've been figuring out some new technology related to the podcast, specifically a new tablature editing program. And I'm not sure if you've noticed yet, but I've attached a tablature page along with this episode. Now, I'm not sure this is the first time I've tried to do that. So Hopefully that's showing up for you, but if anybody is having difficulty opening the tablature page, feel free to email me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. That's also the email address to send me any comments or questions about the podcast, but I'd be happy to just email you directly like a PDF of the tablature that accompanies this episode. But I guess I'm just explaining that as a as a way of pointing out that me learning that program definitely caused a little bit of delay. But I think I have it right. Uh, It should work pretty well for you. It seems to look good on my end. So I guess just let me know if something's not right there, and I'll be happy to uh, clarify it or send a, a better copy to you. Also, before we start, a few announcements about some personal commitments that I have. There are two big events that I have coming up in One is the near future, one is a little further down the road. First one is the Midwest Banjo Camp. This is probably about the 15th year or so for the Midwest Banjo Camp. And what that is, is a weekend long. It's actually Thursday night through Sunday. And it's a camp hosted at a college campus, Olivet College in Michigan. And the faculty that you get, if you go to the website, MidwestBanjoCamp.com, it's uh, just a star-studded faculty in terms of really well-known banjo players and there's also tracks for guitar mandolin bass dobro all the all the main bluegrass instruments and i'm not going to bother listing you the banjo players who are going to be there but suffice to say that it's people that you've heard of and probably some of your banjo heroes definitely some of mine my involvement as i've done for quite a few years is I'm actually the sound guy. I run sound for the faculty concerts that they have on Friday and Saturday in which each of the faculty members gets about a 10 minute set. So that's a lot of fun for me. I get to take out my microphones and mix sound for some of my banjo heroes and it's always great music. So anybody who is in easily enough access to Olivet, Michigan, this is a, I want to say it's the second weekend of June But uh, go to the website if you need more information. That's definitely a worthwhile thing to do if you um, want some banjo immersion in your life. The second one is I've been hired as faculty actually teaching banjo for the Great Lakes Music Camp, um, which is on the coast of Lake Michigan, um, west of Grand Rapids. And that one, the website is greatlakesmusic.org. And once again, it's just a... Very impressive list of faculty members. I'm not going to list them because then I would forget someone and then I would feel bad. And you can just look it up if you're interested. But it's a really cool camp and um, looking forward to both of those events. So anybody who is close enough to Michigan to participate, please do it. They both are shaping up to be fantastic weekends of instruction and music. Okay, so let's get into some of the actual content for this episode here. As you have probably seen, the title of the episode is Right Hand Boot Camp. 
And what I mean by that is this is a way to keep your right hand, assuming that you are a right-handed player. I suppose this uh, could be left-hand boot camp if any of you are southpaws. But right-hand boot camp is a way to keep your right hand in shape. And the reason that it's important to keep your right hand in shape, it goes back to something that I used to tell a lot of my students in private lessons. And that is your left hand, you could have the knowledge of Bela Fleck and know all of your scales and modes and be just a, an acrobat with your left hand. But if your right hand does not pick with solid timing or with accuracy in terms of uh, hitting the right strings at the right time, none of that matters. And you are going to sound way better if you have a very solid right hand, even with some just basic left hand skills, than the other way around. In short, if your right hand is not performing well, nothing else that you do is going to matter. So it's really important to keep that right hand in shape. Another reason I think this is important is a lot of you, like me, are probably really busy with your life and you don't always have those several hours every day to practice like we wish we had. And this is something that I use uh, even to this day as often as possible to just make sure that my playing skills are being not only maintained, but hopefully even pushed a little bit. So in this episode, you're going to learn a few things. You're going to learn the exact roles that I practice that I think keeps my right hand ready for all of my playing situations. Some of them are common roles. Some of them are ones that I have just added to my personal practice routine. You're going to learn how I practice them in order to really strengthen my right hand and make it much more confident with my playing. And you'll learn a few other tricks that I've picked up along the way about how to really practice them in a way that helps your playing and that I see the benefits of, and I think that you will too. Now, before I go any further, I should point out that this episode, actually the, the exercises in this episode, can apply to any level of player. I consider myself a professional level player, and I use these all the time. However, anybody who has just the basic knowledge of some roles, and I'm going to go over a bunch of roles in this episode, anybody who has that basic knowledge can, can use this to get started and improve your right hand. I use this as either a standalone exercise. If I am really limited in my practice time, I try to just get in the the right hand boot camp sequence that I'm going to show you. And that's a good way of maintaining it. But also if even if I have a longer practice session available to me, I do this as a warm up. And you'll be amazed at how good your right hand feels after you go through this um, sequence of exercises, you'll be a lot more confident and a lot more solid with your picking. So what do we need to get started? This is where you're going to refer to the tablature sheet that I attached to the episode here. I'll go through each thing in case you're not able to follow along, but uh, it will be helpful if you have those in front of you to, to check out the fingerings and everything. On this, you will see the eight roll patterns that I use that I think are the best in terms of being able to practice almost all the movements that your right hand will need to make in the course of most people's normal playing. Even though there are eight rolls on the page and eight rolls that I practice, I'm only going to go through the second half, the last four of them. And the reason for this is that I think the first four are covered pretty extensively in almost any instructional material have. Um, that would be the forward roll, the backward roll, the forward reverse, and then what I call the double thumb roll. A lot of books will call it the square roll, um, maybe some other names for it too. Those are out there. I, I am expecting that most of you are probably familiar with those or at least have easy access to a book that has those in it. Either way, they're on that tablature page that I attached, so you can refer to that. However, the next group of four, what I've labeled as the Foggy Mountain Roll, the Double Index Roll, the Double Middle Roll, and the Single String Roll, those are less common, but I think they are really important to bring a balance to your playing. Let's dig right in on to the the first roll that I've given you in addition to those. The first one is the Foggy Mountain Roll. 
And if you listened to episode two, the Jim Mills playing tip, you're already at least a little bit familiar with this role. Um, if you follow along on the sheet, make sure you get the right hand finger incorrect. That's actually the probably the trickiest part about this one. Um, the sequence of the roll is index, middle, thumb, middle, thumb, index, middle, thumb. So all together, it is... And that's an important role that's used for, of course, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. But um, a lot of that Jim Mills stuff that I taught you from episode two. So it's those types of sounds that the Foggy Mountain role is really useful for. The next one is what I call the double index roll. Now, any of these rolls that I call the, there's three of them. There's the double thumb, double index, and double middle. And the reason I call it that is because every other note, in this case, is the index for the double index roll, which means it actually starts on the middle, but it goes middle index, thumb index, middle index, thumb index. So that whole sequence of the roll goes like this. I think this is actually one of the most underrated roles. It can be used for some really cool effects. I know that um, Bela Fleck uses this quite a bit, but the types of sounds that you can get from just using the double index roll would be these kind of things. was exclusively the double index roll you get kind of this rollicking sound that's uh really good for that type of playing the next one is the double middle roll and just like i said a minute ago that means that every other note is the middle so you have middle index middle thumb And the the trademark sound of that double middle roll, a lot of a lot of books that I've seen, if they do teach this roll, they might call it the Dillard roll, because Doug Dillard, a pretty well known banjo player, was uh, pretty well known for using this quite a bit. But here's what that roll sounds like in more of a playing situation. That is all the double middle roll. Uh, the final one is what I call the single string roll. Now this, I will call it a roll just because it's a right hand pattern, but it's noticeably less rolly than the rest of them. And all day long, the single string roll is thumb index, thumb index. And how I have it written on that page, you are going up and down the strings and that helps get you the dexterity that you need. And even though you are unlikely to use that single string roll in exactly that way, I think about the the single string roll as being very akin to using a flat pick on a guitar. So anytime you want to pick out notes that... um, is more guitar oriented you can use that and that has a very distinctive style too so for example if if i was going to play uh let's say turkey in the straw using the single string roll that would sound like this and 
and it, it has a lot of versatile uses. I'm not going to, it's just beyond the scope of this podcast to really get into the differences between the single string style versus Scruggs versus melodic style. But that's an area that you can explore and having this role as part of your practice routine will definitely prepare you for that type of playing. So there's the first task in the right hand boot camp sequence. Go through all these roles and the, the tips that I will give you is tip number one, and this is actually something that Mike Bont said if you listened to the interview with Mike Bont when he was asked the question of if you could recommend any tip to a beginning player, he said the thing that he wished that he would have done but he didn't was pay attention to the fingerings, uh, the right hand fingerings with the rolls. He said that would have really helped him and he actually learned the incorrect way and had to go back and relearn uh, some of the the real basic things. So those fingerings are there for a reason and they're, there's a reason that those are the best fingerings. So pay particularly close attention to that. Go through all the roles. Make sure you're comfortable with them. I would consider you comfortable with them when you can play them uninterrupted on repeat. So let's just take the forward roll, for example. If you can play that on repeat, you will have a sequence that sounds like this. So I want you to notice a few things about the playing. I'm not pausing in between rolls. If you need to pause, such as this, then you either need to slow down the tempo or just keep working at that roll until you are able to do that. Another thing I want you to notice is that I'm playing with very even timing, and that is opposed to like a swing time. So, so here's even time. Here's what I mean by a, a swing timing. Even though that is still at the same tempo, it is not a evenly spaced notes. You want it to be more like a machine gun than, than that swing tempo. In my mind, it's easier to switch to a swing tempo if that's something you need for a song than to go the other way around after you've only practiced a swing tempo the whole time. And of course, we want to make sure that we are hitting each string cleanly and only one string at a time. If you hear yourself hitting multiple strings or hitting the incorrect string, a string that you don't mean to hit, that's something that you need to really slow down. Make sure you are resting at least one finger on the head to give yourself a stable reference point and really just hone in on being able to perform these roles straight through without uh, without too many mistakes. So you've gone through and you've practiced these roles and you have them memorized and you can play them continuously on repeat with the proper fingering and without mistakes. What is the next step in right hand boot camp? For the next step, what you're going to need is a metronome or a metronome, I guess what I'll call a metronome substitute. The metronome substitute that I use is a computer program, and it's called Band in a Box. And what Band in a Box is, is it's a programmable metronome. And you can program in chord changes and different rhythm patterns, and of course the speed, as with, the, as with all metronomes. But even if you're just stuck with you know, an old school metronome that sits on your table or perhaps a metronome app. I believe that there are probably a million of those that you can get. They all serve the same purpose and which is keeping steady time. And that's what right hand boot camp is really all about is keeping really steady time, practicing all these roles. So for the rest of this episode, I'm going to be using my band in a box program as an example but pretty much everything I'm doing is going to apply the same whether or not you have that program and regardless of what type of metronome you're choosing to use. The first step is going to be find a tempo at which you can perform all of 
all eight of the roles um, without making mistakes. In fact, once you find that tempo, it might be useful to actually start a bit even slower than that. Practicing slow rolls is actually very good for your timing too. Some numbers just to give you an idea. When I start my practicing, I start at 108 BPM. And that is a slower medium tempo. If you are more toward the beginner side of things, or if a lot of these rolls are brand new to you, you might want to start down at 80 BPM, whatever you have to do to be able to perform them correctly. But either way, here's what it sounds like when I dial in. I think this is actually 115 BPM on Band in a Box. This is the, the metronome program that I use and what it sounds like. And so what you'll hear is it actually gives a count in, a woodblock count in, and then I've programmed this to be a bluegrass style rhythm to help me give better context to the banjo rolls. So as you can hear, it's not the uh, most authentic bluegrass band sound. It's a little video gamey, but to my ears, it's a bit more pleasant than listening to a standard TikTok or just uh, clapping sound of most metronomes. So I'm willing to deal with it to, to help me practice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start that metronome sequence over again, and you'll hear what it sounds like to play a forward roll right along with this 115 BPM uh, metronome. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you have this program or an app or a tabletop metronome. Just listen, focus in on the, on the tempo and try to sync your role playing up exactly with uh, that tempo to get a really steady timing. And you get the point. You play along with the metronome and you focus in on the timing as close as you possibly can and play with as much precision as you possibly can. Now here is a secret trick that I'm going to take credit for inventing. I've never heard anybody else talk about this or give this advice. What I do is I take a single sheet of notebook paper, and it's pretty important that it's thin paper like notebook paper. It can't be cardstock or recipe cards or something like that. But what I do is I weave it in the strings of my banjo. And so, doing that right now. And what you're left with, if you, if you weave the paper in and out, now you get it out of the way of your picking hand, but you leave it over the neck, maybe really close to the pot of the banjo, you end up with a very flat, almost uh, snare drum, kind of sound with the paper muting the strings. So as you can hear, it's a very percussive sound. And there's a reason for that. That's going to allow us, rather than having the open notes ringing out against the rhythm of the metronome, now you're going to be able to hear a very precise moment of attack for your right hand. And you're going to use that to focus in on the clicks of the metronome or the rhythm of band in the box if you have that program like I do but either way this this adds an extra amount of precision and I was pretty amazed when I switched to this technique rather than just practicing rolls using open strings I was pretty amazed at how I had little parts of my rolls that were not quite um, syncing up with the metronome, even though I thought they were when I was playing it with the open strings. So this has allowed me to be even that much more precise. So here's what it sounds like when I practice that forward roll with the paper in the strings trick 
um, along with the Band in the Box track. So even though this might be the most obnoxious sounding podcast ever, hopefully you recognize how much that helps you hone in on the exact rhythm to have that paper woven in between the strings. I felt like it really helped me. Now, if if you noticed at the very end there, the backup chords with the band in the box switched to a minor chord, and that's for a very specific reason. And part of the reason that I like Band in the Box is that you can program it. And how I've programmed it, I have eight rolls that I practice, the, the rolls that I gave you on those uh, sheets. So I can program it to do eight loops of 16 measures each. And the way I signal to myself that it's almost time to switch rolls is it switches to that minor chord. And that tells me, okay, I'm about to switch to the next roll. So if I was just practicing the forward roll, the next one would be the backward roll, and then to the forward reverse, and then it keeps on going through all eight rolls. And when I'm done, then what I do is I speed it up a little bit. I mentioned that I start at 108 BPM. I go in increments of seven. I'm not sure how I ended up deciding that. It's just how I do it. You can you can choose whatever increments you want or whatever increments you're metronome has but i find seven to be a a big enough bump up that it's a a noticeable increase in speed but not so much that it doesn't allow me to gradually warm up to each roll and i also told you to start at a tempo in which you can perform all of the rolls all the way through it's not too hard to envision that as you speed up you are going to find certain roles that you're better at and certain roles that you are perhaps a little weaker at. That's totally normal. However, I would encourage you to do as best as you can to bring these roles along evenly. There would be nothing worse than playing perhaps an up-tempo song in a way that you're comfortable with, but then maybe you get to a certain section that you have to play a certain way and, ooh, you didn't practice that specific right-hand maneuver at that tempo and that's your weak spot and so your timing suffers in the middle of a song. We don't want that. We want you to be able to seamlessly go from one right-hand pattern to the other at any tempo, hopefully with equal comfort between each type of roll. That being said, it's going to happen. For me... The double index roll happens to be the one at which I notice um, falls off the quickest. So the double index roll is this. And what I do when I'm practicing this, if I get to a certain speed at which I don't think I can play the double index roll continuously throughout the whole thing, I'll break it up from full speed to half speed. So if I'm if I don't feel like I'm playing up to tempo, this is what I will end up doing. In other words, don't just give up playing the role. You should still practice it as as well as you can and just do your best to try to bring it along at the same speed as you can play all of the other roles. So in summary, what I do is I start out at 108 BPM. I stick that piece of paper in the strings of the instrument. I play through all the rolls for 16 measures each at 108. After that, I move up, like I said, by increments of 7. So that's 115, then 122, then 129, then 136. I'm sorry, you were told there would be no math, but here we are. And I keep doing that as as long as I possibly can 
and I'd really try to push myself to push the tempo because that's how we improve is by continuing to play just a little bit on the edge of our of our comfort zone in terms of what speed we can handle. Um, another important thing is after you finish, let's say just at 108 BPM, make sure you take a, a short break, stretch your wrist, stretch your forearm, stretch your fingers. You don't want to have any pain involved in this. And if you are experiencing pain, probably a good time to, to stop and don't push yourself too much. You don't want to get hurt. But as much as you can, really try to persevere through these excessive speeds. So just to give you some landmark speed markers, I usually consider 120 to be a normal upbeat bluegrass tempo. Once you get into about 140 to 150, that is fast bluegrass tempo. Once you get to up to about 160 and higher, that's when you hear the, the serious professional Michael Cleveland, third time out, their blazing bluegrass songs are, are up in that 160 to 170 range, maybe even sometimes about 180 for the very, very tip top. So that's how you can measure your playing. If you, if you are topping out at about 120, that's getting you to a good upbeat bluegrass tempo. If you can get to 150, you're going to be able to play most things for most situations with that kind of speed. Great job if that describes you because I practice this stuff all the time and it's a, a really good day if I can play all of these roles up at 150 and higher. Typically, some of them fall off and I have to do that halftime trick. So I think that's going to do it for Right Hand Boot Camp and for this episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Right Hand Boot Camp is a pretty simple concept, but I think you'll really be amazed at how confident your playing will will feel if you take the time to go through this battery of exercises, especially if you can manage to try to do this every day. I think you'll find that when you start playing, your right hand will feel better right off the bat than um, if you hadn't done all these warm-ups. So just to do one more recap, look at those sheets that I attached to this file and learn all eight of those roles. A lot of those are going to be different than when you than what you typically learn in any of the books that might be out there. But I think they cover most of the different moves that your right hand is going to be called upon to do. Practice those all so that you can play them continuously without pausing in between, just on loop. Uh, pay attention to the fingering on those pages. Refer to the sheet if you need to. And then, of course, the main thing is play all the notes with clean and steady picking. That's the whole point of this. And if you are uh, fumbling around hitting incorrect strings, then that's, that's a sign that you need to, to slow these down and take more time and make sure you are being as precise as, uh, as possible. Uh, the next step, get a metronome or an app or program that, that keeps good steady time. Find the speed at which you can play all of the eight rolls very comfortably. The next step, which is what I took all the credit for as being my idea, but I think it's really important, weave that piece of notebook paper in your strings. This whole exercise will be pay played with that notebook paper and the strings that really helps you go the extra step in focusing in on the precision of your right hand timing. Again, that's the whole point of this, is to be as precise with your right hand as possible. And that piece of paper allows you to do that. Then, play each of the rolls 16 times through. Or at least that's what I do. You could do longer if you want. But I think 16 feels like a good amount of practicing, but still short enough that you'll you can get through them all in a, a half hour practice session or so then gradually increase the speed i kind of mentioned five to eight bpm as a good increment to feel like you're bumping it up but um allow you to acclimate to each increased speed and keep pushing yourself another aspect of this is that you will increase right hand accuracy but you will also increase your speed and that's what happens if you keep pushing the the tempo on your metronome you'll notice that the slower speeds that you used to start at are going to keep getting easier and easier as your right hand strengthens so that's going to wrap it up there folks thanks again for listening to this episode of the picky fingers banjo podcast if you need anything if you need me to email you a pdf of the roll patterns that i talked about email me at picky fingers banjo podcast at gmail.com 
That's also the address that you can email any of your comments or questions or feedback about this or any other episode. Always enjoy hearing from you, and I do try to respond to every email that I get about the podcast. And I'd especially love to hear about people's experience trying this new right hand boot camp that I just talked about. Tell me if it's improving your playing or maybe you hate it. Either way, uh, feel free to reach out, and I look forward to that. So that does it for me. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.